I think we're about at 2.30, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Performance Profiling Tools and Tricks. Uh, I am your guide. Uh, my name is Brad Blake. I'm a software architect at Phase 2. Uh, and there's my email. That's a good way to get a hold of me if you have any feedback or questions after the talk. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about profiling, but first I'm going to talk about what profiling isn't, because I think there's some misconceptions about what profiling is. So profiling is not the same as benchmarking. Um, in benchmarking, you're kind of looking at how your system performs under certain conditions, like load. You're looking at the big picture, like throughput, um, you know, concurrent users, things like that. Uh, profiling is sort of more granular than that. Um, it's also not the same as debugging. Like when you're profiling, you can certainly expose bugs in your code and the need to do some debugging to find it, but they're sort of two separate actions. Um, and the last thing is it's not a dark art. Like profiling gets this reputation as like it's, you know, it might be tough to do and, you know, there might be like one guy on your team that can do it. But that's not the truth. You're not just going to go send somebody into a closet and say like fix this problem, make it faster. Like, there are tools and techniques that make sure that anyone can do it. So what is profiling? Generally, it's gathering data on the performance of a system. So you're looking at, like, CPU and memory usage. You're looking at function calls and times and things like that, and a whole host of other metrics. Um, and the goal is really to find where the system is spending its time. Because once you have that data, then you can combine that with you know, your knowledge of the application and you can dive in and fix the problem. Um, and when I say fix the problem, I'm talking about refactoring your code, your app, whatever. I'm not talking about you know, enhancing a bunch of functionality and changing a lot of things around. I'm talking about just changing what, what the problem is. Um, for any of My Little Pony fans out there or parents or whatever, profiling also should be fun. Like, maybe not Pinkie Pie fun. Uh, I'm a dad, not a brony. Uh, my wife asked me to clarify. Uh, but it's fun. It's like something you know, that you don't get to do every day. It's a chance to learn you know, new techniques, new tools, do something that's out of the ordinary, right? So you should be excited about getting to profile your code, uh, even though that means that generally something is broken or not performing right. So there's two types of profiling that I'm going to talk about. Um, the first is event-based profiling, uh, and that's where you're gathering data that's triggered by specific events, like every time a function is called, you're going to gather data. Um, and that type of profiling is generally slower because you're performing that action a lot more times. You're gathering a lot more data. The trade-off is obviously you have more data. It's going to be more accurate. So event-based profilers, um, generally can't be like used in a production environment because of that reason, but they're really good to track down the problem. Uh, and then there's sampler, sampling profiles or statistical profiles, um, and that's where you're going to record data at specific intervals, like uh, you know, every tenth of a second, every second, you're going to trap some data like the call stack, uh, and then you're going to use that uh, to debug. Those are generally less accurate and specific, like you're going to be missing some data, like what happens in between the sampling windows, but they're less intrusive as well. So you can use a lot of these profilers um, on production environments with limited overhead. Um, some things to consider before you start, like number one is, do you really have a performance issue? You know, if the CEO drops his head in your cube and says the site's slow, does that really mean the site is slow? Or does that mean he's got his network settings all screwed up? And you know, if you run traceroute, everything is good. Or you fix his computer, everything's good. Like, do you have data that actually indicates you have a performance problem rather than anecdotal evidence? Um, and also, how big of an issue is it? Like, is it something that you can live with? Is it something that only happens for administrative users? You know, some pages are slow. Or is this affecting everyone? You know, where does it rank in terms of priorities for the site? Um, you know, are new features more important for the business than making the site faster or vice versa? You might want to benchmark to, uh, to get a sort of a before picture so that you can compare it with the after. You know, some of the tools I use, uh, AB or Apache Bench, uh, that's pretty much standard on all systems. Sort of limited, um, HTTP perf, uh, I actually said that right. Um, 
is a little more advanced. Um, one of the nice features is it'll keep sending requests to your system even after it's overloaded and not responding. So you can sort of simulate real world like what'll actually happen when your site gets overloaded. Uh, Siege is like Apache Bench, but you can do multiple URLs because it's multi-threaded. So instead of you know, just giving it one URL, you can give it a bunch and throw traffic at a bunch of URLs. Uh, and JMeter is sort of the old standby, right, of like actually doing a good load test, get, getting some good benchmark tools, because uh, you can sort of simulate what users are gonna do on your site. Uh, and the last thing is determine what your goal is. And it doesn't need to be a specific number, a specific percentage. You just have to know when you're done. Like, what's the definition of done uh, to put on my PM hat or Agile hat? Um, like, when will you know that, that you've accomplished your goal? Um, so some things to look at. Um, get to a functional system quickly and then measure it. But it needs to be a real system. If you're trying to profile demoware or something that's half done, uh, you're sort of wasting time. Because uh, again, the alternative is to prematurely optimize, and we know that prematurely optimizing is the root of all evil. Um, that might be a little harsh, but uh, when you prematurely optimize, you're just guessing, and you're probably going to waste time. Um, be data-driven. Um, having data is the only way to fix what's really wrong with your program. Um, tail, especially dash F, is your friend. Like, don't be afraid to open up 10 different windows, tailing 10 different log files at the same time. You want to find the error message. You want to get as much data as you can get. Um, go after items with the highest cost, and that's not necessarily the outliers. So just, uh, just because something is the slowest doesn't mean that's the worst. So if you execute something you know, 50 times uh, a page load, and I hope you don't execute 50 something, something 50 times a page load, but if you do, you know, making that a fraction better is probably gonna be better than making one thing a lot better. Uh, and test after each change, um, you know, so that you make sure you know what actually fixed the problem and you're not combining different things. Uh, so this is my um, don't assume slide. Uh, sometimes, and this is a back to the future reference, predicting the Cubs are gonna win this year, I hope. Um, but anyway, sometimes when you assume or guess or predict, you're actually gonna be right, but most of the time you're not. So we don't wanna make assumptions, we wanna be empirical, right? We wanna go with what the data tells us to go with. Um, and we don't want to assume that the data won't change. This is especially applicable with like queries, um, but with data and the system in general, like the more data you get, you're going to expose different things that are going to become real performance problems. Um, don't assume your caching is working. So if you've got a performance problem, like don't assume Akamai's caching or Varnish or Memcache or Redis or whatever. Um, check to make sure that the, the headers show it's caching. Check to make sure your data is getting stored. Uh, query cache is actually working. You know, we had the, uh, we had a site launch, um, and we'd done all of our testing, you know, uh, Akamai, Varnish, everything was great, right? And we turn the switches, and the servers go on fire. Um, and so we're all scrambling around, you know, meetings upon meetings upon meetings, trying to figure out what the problem is. And then we're in a conference call, and I look, and I'm like, oh, hey, guys, like, uh, Akamai is showing a pass. And so is varnish. No, 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 that can't be the problem, right? We tested that. Um, it actually turned out it was the problem. Somebody made a change, which disabled all caching and servers on fire. Uh, so, you know, we had assumed that everything was working, so don't assume. Um, Obamacare. What? No, it was not Obamacare. Uh, and <laughs> had nothing to do with that. Um, and don't prematurely optimize. I'll say it again because I can't say it enough. Um, don't over-optimize. Like, unless speed is mission critical to you, there's going to be a point at which the cost benefits of actually continuing to optimize are actually going to be not in your favor. Um, I'm a big data migration guy. Do it early in the life cycle of a project or use realistic substitute data. And the key is realistic. When you actually get real data in your app instead of you know, no data or fake data, you're going to expose a lot of performance issues and you're going to need to profile. And it's a lot easier to profile before you launch than after you launch. Um, have a good test suite. Um, we found that like using Jenkins with like Behat um, 
is really good because you can measure how long the BHAT tests take. And then if you have like a nightly build or you run the test nightly, you can chart in graphs like how long the tests are taking the runs. So you can see if there's a point at which your tests all of a sudden spike, and then you can trace it back and you can actually have sort of a frame of reference to look for when you're profiling. Um, bonus points if you have something email you when something gets really out of bounds so that you don't have to go to remember to look at the Jenkins graphs, you can actually just check your email. Um, and figure that you might need to dump your data from the beginning. Um, don't anger your sysadmins and dump everything to the logs to make syslog grow. They will yell at you. Um, but make sure that it's configurable. You might need to dump your data at some point. Increasing memory is not a fix. If you're running out of memory, increasing memory won't help you. But if you get out of memory errors, think about what your system has a lot of. Like, does it have a lot of loops? Is it loading a lot of data? And that can point you in the right direction. Um, understand big O concepts. I'm not talking about interviewing at Google where you need to like memorize big O of like all the different sorting mechanisms or whatever. But understand that like as your data grows, certain functions will scale better than others. Uh, and match production settings. Doesn't matter what you use, profile on prod or a reasonable facsimile thereof. So I mentioned tools. Um, what are some of the tools that we can use to do profiling? Um, in PHP, uh, there's a couple main ones, XHProf and XDebug. Um, but there's also New Relic, which I threw on the PHP slide because I've used it for PHP. But uh, it's a service that does real-time monitoring and profiling of a lot of things, including uh, Ruby, Python, PHP, Node. It even does Docker containers now. Uh, so it's a pretty nice service. Um, XHProf is the first one I was going to talk about. Um, it was created by Facebook originally, and it's available on Peckle, so you can just install it. Um, it'll get you some basic statistics, and it can do sampling, uh, which is really nice because you can generate flame graphs from it. Um, another nice feature that I love is you can do a diff of different runs, uh, and you can aggregate runs. You can generate stats from, like, you know, not a full day's worth of runs, hopefully, but like you know, you can run it for a short period of time, get a lot of data, aggregate it, and see if there's a commonality of things that are slow. Um, I'm a, sort of a Drupal guy, uh, so it's nice. It's got modules and plugins for Drupal and WordPress. So if you are in that space, uh, you can just drop it in. Uh, the thing I'm not totally, I don't totally love about XHProf is the GUI isn't the best. Um, it's pretty basic. It's functional is a nice way to put it. Uh, there are some side projects like XHGUI, which do make it better um, and sort of more modern. Uh, XDebug is a good debugger and profiler. Um, it gets you a lot of data. Um, and the output can be used in Kcache Grind, if anyone has used that, or Qcache Grind, if you're using it on a Mac. Um, and Kcache Grind is like a nice visualization tool for call stack data uh, that you can just, with a couple steps, uh, you know, brew install a couple things on your Mac, and then you can go and open anything in it, any call stack data. Uh, it's also integrated in PHP Storm, which is why a lot of people use it. Uh, for Ruby, um, there's a built-in profiler module, but it's really not worth using. Um, it doesn't get you much data. Uh, it's pretty basic. So what do you use? RubyProf is sort of the gold standard, uh, the RubyProf gem. It's an event-based profiler. Uh, it gets you a whole lot of different reports, different options. You can get text and HTML reports uh, of a variety of different things, uh, call graphs, call stacks, uh, flat profiles. Uh, it's really easy to set up, and you can profile your whole app or just specific chunks of it. So you can wrap specific blocks of code in like profiler lines and then see how that's performing. Uh, or you can start up your server with it and, and profile your whole app. Uh, this is just a, an example of a couple of uh, graphs so I can set up something later. Um, a, a flat profile graph and a, uh, a call stack graph. Um, as you can see, they're not the prettiest. Um, they take some interpreting. Uh, perftools.rb might be my favorite. Um, it's a sampling profiler. It's a fork of uh, Google perftools for Ruby. 
Uh, it's got a ton of different output modes, uh, including call grind if you want to use Kcash grind. Um, it's also really easy to set up. Uh, and if you're doing Rails, um, we've got Rack Perf Tools Profiler. Um, it's got more limited output modes, but the really nice thing is it outputs everything to the browser. So if you just go to your app, you know, your Ruby app, and uh, you put uh, profile equals true in the browser, you'll get your output from the profiler instead of whatever you were supposed to output. Um, so you don't have to go digging around in the file system or anything like that. Uh, and it'll give you text, uh, GIF, or PDF output. Uh, so you can just go save it and use it. Um, you can also do things like, in the uh, query parameters, change the frequency of the sampling, change the mode, for a variety of different things. Um, that's another sort of ugly uh, call graph. Um, Node uh, has probably enough that we could fill the whole conference with people talking about Node profilers. Um, some of the ones that I like, uh, Node WebKit Agent um, is pretty good to set up and download. Um, WebStorm is the JavaScript IDE. It's got some profiling built into it. Strong Loop Arc and Node Source are services that also allow you to do profiling. Uh, the latter one, Node Source, just came out with a new release that has a lot of incredible visualizations for your data. So that one's worth checking out, and I believe that's, that's free to use uh, for developers. Uh, so flame graphs. Um, who here has used flame graphs or heard of them? Just a couple of you, great. Um, so this is a flame graph. Um, as the title of the slide indicates, it's pretty. Um, it's not like developer or designer pretty, but we're not at a design conference, so uh, I shouldn't get things thrown at me for saying this is pretty. Uh, but it's a lot better than all of the other graphs I showed. It's more readable, um, and you can figure things out a lot better. So what is a flame graph? And my mouse is over here. Um, it's a visual representation of profiled software. Um, for our purposes, we're going to be talking about the call stack, but you can make a flame graph out of just about anything. Um, each layer uh, is a function, and each column is the amount of time spent in the function. So it's pretty basic. Um, that's all you need to know. So why am I going to use this thing that you showed me? Uh, one is it's easy for non-technical people to see it. Um, if I show them a really ugly graph, they're probably going to not have any idea what I'm talking about. But I can show a CEO or something like this, this, and with a little bit of explaining, they can see what the problem is, and they'll have a lot more buy-in into why they need to spend the money and the resources to fix a problem. Uh, it's also easy to diagnose quick problems. Um, it's not going to be your end-all, be-all. And I see flame graphs kind of criticized a lot for like, well, you know, it doesn't give me all the info. But it's not really supposed to. It's supposed to, in one shot, be able to show you if there's any glaring problem. Uh, so it'll show you like what was on the CPU at each interval. So you can see if something is on the CPU at like 10 straight intervals for a second, and you think it should be a lot faster than that, you've got a problem. Um, it's low overhead. Uh, you can pretty much you know, run a, uh, a Perl script, um, generate an SVG, and there's your flame graph. Uh, and again, they're pretty. Like, don't underestimate the value of pretty or nice uh, in explaining things to people. So these flame graphs are cool. How do I generate them? Um, there's a library here on GitHub by a, a Netflix engineer, Brendan Gregg, um, which has uh, all the, the scripts you'll need to create flame graphs. It also has a lot of good documentation on how to do so. Um, you basically just need call stack data uh, that's been converted to the right format, and these scripts here are available on GitHub, and you can get started generating them. Uh, so uh, for PHP, um, there's a nice XHProf flame graph library here uh, where you can take uh, output from XHProf and create uh, flame graph readable uh, input. Um, Xdebug has a lot of different libraries that'll create flame graphs or flame graph data. 
Um, Drupal uh, has XHPROF sample and XHPROF flame graph modules that you can just drop in and get flame graphs of any page. Uh, Ruby uh, has uh, Rack Mini Profiler, which is a nice profiler in and of itself. Uh, it'll give you like a speed badge on your page where you can see how long each template, each partial is taking the render, all your SQL queries. Uh, but I mention it here because you can also combine it with the flame graph gem uh, and create flame graphs as long as, as long as you're using Ruby 2 and up. Uh, and Node, um, in addition to some of the services I mentioned before, which all have flame graphs, uh, you can use the perf library on Linux um, and uh, generate flame graphs. Um, you can also use this uh, GitHub library node stack viz. Uh, the downside of that is it requires dtrace on your system. Um, so if you don't have that on your system, you can't use this one. So what does a healthy flame graph look like? Uh, one of my colleagues at the phase two booth sort of likens it to uh, a cardiologist. You go through a lot of training to figure out what a, a normal EKG looks like, right? And so once you know what a normal one looks like, anything else that doesn't fit that is bad. Uh, and the same thing is kind of true with flame graphs. So what am I looking for here? Um, the main things I'm looking for are, there shouldn't be anything at the top of the flame graph that goes on for a long time, unless I expect it. Um, and there also shouldn't be anything, anything that shows up that I don't expect. Um, so this one is pretty evenly spaced. None of the call stacks are too high. Um, everything looks pretty even. Um, and in terms of this, like each column is a tenth of a second measurement. Uh, and then the call stack goes up. So whatever is at the top was on the CPU whenever the sample was taken. So what does a bad one look like? Like this one. Um, this was taken uh, in Drupal. Uh, I believe it's something like 220 samples. So the page took about 22 seconds to load. Um, and so we see there's this giant PDO statement at the top. Uh, and so obviously that's a pretty big problem. But then we can trace it down and go, okay, what's calling that? And you trace it even down farther. And I see this Drupal cron run at the bottom that's taking up almost the entire time. Um, I wouldn't expect a cron run normally to be happening during a page load. But Drupal has this thing where you can set crons to happen every three hours, six hours, or whatever during page loads because if you don't have access to cron tab on your system or on your provider, you know, it'll run it for you. So you know, pretty easy if I have the uh, sampling data, I create a flame graph. Like, it doesn't take longer than about 15 seconds to trace this thing down and figure out the problem. Click a setting in the UI and I fix the problem. Right, and so you know, with other things, I might have had to do a lot more investigation than this. The other thing to note um, is that the functions can get squashed together. So this PDO statement execute at the top over here doesn't mean that's one statement. It just means that each time uh, the sampler took data, a PDO statement was at the top. Uh, and so what it did, instead of showing us like, you know, PDO statement, PD, you know, it just squashed it, all, squashed it all together for us. This is another unhealthy one. Um, you can see that, again, like there's some things, fread, uh, which is sort of unexpectedly on the top for a long time. Turns out we're making, H making HTTP requests, uh, which we probably don't want to do. Um, but again, like, I can look at it, be like, this is unhealthy. What exactly is calling what? And then get a good idea of, of if you have any glaring problems with your app. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is query tuning. Because um, a lot of the times what I see um, is we've isolated the problem to be MySQL or be our queries or something like that. So it's like, okay, what's the problem? Well, this thing's got a lot of joins or like it's got an outer join. It must be the problem, right? Um, but as I mentioned before, if you don't have data, then you're just guessing. So 
how do we get data to figure out why our queries are bad and what queries are bad? So uh, we have the slow query log in MySQL. Uh, use the slow query log and slow query log file um, settings, and you can uh, turn on the slow query log. And that's going to log all your queries that satisfy a couple conditions, that they take at least x number of seconds and examine at least x number of rows. Uh, I believe by default this is 10 seconds and zero rows. So it's probably not going to capture a lot of queries. Uh, and any MySQL or Percona people in the audience, feel free to heckle me if I say something wrong. Um, it's not going to get your admin statements like alter, drop, create, uh, et cetera. Um, and there is what sounds like a nice little switch called log queries not using indexes. And you would think, well, I want to turn, I want to see all my queries that don't use indexes, right? Because those are probably going to be bad. But you're going to get a lot of extra data using this. Because um, sometimes MySQL thinks, you know, doing a full table scan uh, is going to be the best way to go. Um, a query that doesn't use indexes doesn't mean it's a bad query or a slow query. Uh, so just know that if you decide to log everything not using indexes, you're going to get a lot of false positives. Uh, Mongo, uh, you can turn on profiling as well, uh, db.setprofiling level, uh, and it stores your profile data in the system.profile collection. Uh, you can also use show process list or show full process list in MySQL. And that'll show you the queries that are currently executing and what state they're in. So if you have something that looks like it's hung, you can go show full process list and see all your queries and see what state they're in. And some of the common states, uh, sending data, which means it's sending data back to the client, copying to temp table, locked uh, for certain uh, engines. Uh, so that's pretty useful if you've got some long running queries. Uh, MySQL dump slow will parse your slow query log uh, and show you sort of uh, some group together queries, show you some stats. Um, Percona has something that's even better called PT Query Digest, which in addition to doing some of the things my, MySQL dump slow will do, will actually show you uh, the, the queries that have the highest aggregate total. Uh, so when I talk about like you want to focus in on some of the things that run more frequently, because they might be better to optimize. PT Query Digest will help you sort of hone in on which queries those are. Um, and logging in your app, like a lot of apps um, have logging enabled where you can like see all the slow queries or see all the queries. So why is my query slow? Um, this in and of itself can be like a three hour session or more. Um, some of the common things though, uh, are there's just too much data. Um, so you might be fetching too many columns or rows. Uh, a common uh, problem is like select star. Uh, so if you use select star, you're going to get all the columns in the table, uh, and that's bad for a couple reasons. Um, one is you're not going to be able to use a covering index. Uh, so instead of being able to read the data that you really need from an index, you're probably going to go to disk. Um, and the other is you're just sending a lot of data you don't need to send back to the client. Uh, and examining too many rows. Um, so if MySQL has to examine too many rows, that's going to make things slow as well. Like common examples of that are uh, if, you, uh, if you forgot a limit, um, if you have a where and you have to generate all the results before you throw some things out, uh, if you don't have proper indexes, um, MySQL is going to examine more rows than, than you really need to. Um, a poorly designed schema. Uh, the thing I'm going to mention here is that shorter rows are generally better, so use the smallest data type you need for whatever your columns are. Um, some things when they create uh, temp tables will use all the available space regardless of how much data there actually is. So the larger your data types, the larger your temp table is going to be, and the slower your performance in those cases. Um, and the lock, lack of proper indexes. Um, note, I didn't say the lack of indexes, um, because adding an index is not necessarily going to fix your problem. Adding a proper index can fix your problem. Uh, and what do I mean by that? I mean, 
You want to make sure that uh, the columns you're joining on are indexed. Um, you want to make sure that if you have, uh, let's see, uh, an order by, that, that you have an index on that as well in the proper order. Um, you want to make sure that you can use a covering index in some cases. Uh, and that's uh, an index that has all of the columns that you need to select. So you can just go to the index and grab your data instead of having to go and fetch all the data from the disk. Um, too many indexes uh, is actually also a problem on inserts. Uh, the more indexes you have, the slower your inserts are going to be. So be judicious with your uh, indexes. Don't just create one for every column. That's probably going to be not beneficial in the long run. Uh, inefficient SQL uh, is another reason. Um, so I hear a lot of like, should this be a subquery? Should this be a join? Uh, the answer is, I don't know. Like, it really depends on your situation. Uh, this is sort of where trial and error will work for you. Um, in general, joins are probably going to be better, but in some cases, subqueries are going to be better. Uh, count star um, is probably going to be slow unless you're on my ISAM. Uh, which, and you're not using a where clause, in which case you can just look at the table stats and go, this is how many rows there are. In all the other cases, um, you're probably going to have to generate the full result set. Um, so uh, that's something where if you can get away without using count and just you know, get an estimate or something like that, you might be better off. Uh, high offsets, if you do something like limit 5,000, uh, comma 10, you're just going to generate a lot of data and throw it away. Uh, you're better off rewriting your query as a range query, like using between, uh, or even better, like figuring out what the last thing you got was and then sticking that in the where, like, you know, where this is greater than blah, limit 10. Um, that's going to have a lot better performance. Uh, disk versus memory, obviously fetching things from memory is faster than disk, so make sure that you've got enough memory allocated and that uh, whatever you need to fit in memory can fit in there. Um, sorting can be slow, so make sure you've got uh, columns you're going to be ordering by indexed um, and that they're actually able to be used. Uh, the query cache, um, believe it or not, can slow things down, because uh, what actually the query cache does is if you've got it turned on when a query comes in, it does a case insensitive hash lookup and says, have I seen this query before? And if so, return the result set. If not, then I have to go execute the query and store the result set. And then every insert after that has to not only do its inserts, but then it goes through and says, OK, all the tables I just modified, I have to invalidate all the entries in the query cache which use these tables. So you're doing a lot of overhead on both sides, on the select and on the insert. And the question is, is that going to be better than, or is that going to be worse than, than like taking advantage of the query cache? So like for write heavy sites, query cache generally bad. For uh, sites that have a lot of complex queries that have small result sets, query cache good. Um, sort of the answer of whether you should turn it on or not is depends on the types of queries that you have. So how do I get data about what the query is actually doing and what the problem might be. You just listed like eight different problems, and there's probably actually hundreds. You can use explain. So in MySQL, you can prefix your select query with explain, uh, and it'll give you the execution path that the optimizer chose for that particular query. Uh, Postgres has something similar, uh, explain and explain analyze, which will show you what path it actually took. Um, by executing the query. Mongo has something similar. Pretty much every database has something similar. So you mentioned this optimizer thing. Like, what does it do? So when you send a query in, the MySQL optimizer will choose the execution path with the lowest cost. And that's not necessarily the fastest query. That's looking at the number of rows, the indexes, cardinality, key length, et cetera, and figuring out what it thinks is the lowest cost to execute the query. Uh, in 5.6, uh, there's a nice thing called Optimizer Trace, which will actually show you a lot of info uh, about why it made the decisions it made uh, and what the various costs were. Um, and in 5.7, there's something called Explain uh, Format equals JSON, which will give you JSON output with a lot of that same data. 
So you can see like what the various costs were of the various, the various types of queries um, and figure out why it shows the path it did. Uh, and then the optimizer does things like reorder and convert joins, subquery optimization. It does a lot of things. So what's the output look like? So I've got a basic query here. I've got a select, uh, a couple joins, uh, a subquery in my from that'll create a drive table, you know, and then a where and then a limit. And so when I run explain, um, what's at the top is sort of what I got. Uh, and you can get different output. If you, if you put slash capital G, it'll show you like more vertical output. Uh, I like horizontal. Um, and so what do these columns look like? Uh, so ID, the first column, is the select that the row belongs to. It's usually one, unless you've got subqueries or unions or something like that. Uh, select type uh, will tell you whether it's uh, simple, uh, in the case of a normal select, or complex. And if it's complex, it'll give you like primary, uh, which is the outermost query, uh, derived, which is like a subquery in from, uh, union, or th there's a bunch of other types, but those are sort of the most common. Uh, table, the third column is the table name or alias. Uh, and then type, the fourth column, is probably one of the couple most important, and that's the access type, or how my SQL is going to access the rows. So uh, I see a couple here that's all, and that's usually a full table scan, and that's generally bad unless you have a small table. Um, Index uh, does a full, full scan of the index, and range does a limited index scan. That's like when you're doing between on an index column. Uh, you can have ref or EQ ref. Um, those both refer to like how the things are joined. Uh, so EQ ref is one of the best types. Um, that's when you join a unique non-null index, like a primary key uh, and an indexed field. So you've only got one, one possible row that's going to match. Uh, and const or constant is going to only return one value from an index. That's like when you're selecting something from a, from a primary key and you actually give the value in the where clause. Uh, possible keys here, that'll show you which possible indexes the optimizer thought it could use. Um, key is which index actually is going to be used. Um, fun note, the key doesn't have to appear in the list of possible keys. Sometimes it won't. Uh, key length is the bytes of the index that was used. So if it's a large index, you can see how, you know, based on how many bytes were used, which columns it was looking at. Uh, and then ref, uh, sort of the, the field that used to look up values in the index or the constant. Uh, rows uh, is probably number two in the biggies. Um, that's an estimate of the rows MySQL will need to read. Uh, sometimes that can be wildly inaccurate for certain engines. Um, but it, again, it, it's an estimate. Um, it's also a Cartesian product. Uh, so to get the number of rows it's going to have to scan, you multiply all of them together, not add. Um, so you, that's probably above my math abilities, but that's a really big number. Um, extra is going to have uh, everything else. So notes about using file sort, uh, which means that my, my SQL is going to do the sorting itself rather than read from an index. Using temporary means it's, it's using a temporary table. Um, that doesn't mean on disk, it could be in memory. Um, using file sort and using temporary together is sort of the double whammy of creating a temporary table to hold the full result set and then sorting it. Uh, so if you see that, you probably want to try to fix it. Uh, using where uh, basically means that, um, well, yes, it's using a where clause, but it's generating a lot of results and throwing a lot of them away. Uh, and then using index um, is different than index in the type. Uh, that means it's using a covering index. Uh, there's a lot more. Um, those are some four of the most common. Uh, and explain sometimes lies or is inaccurate. Um, so one of the reasons is the table statistics are wrong. You can run analyze table to update the stats. Uh, and that might make the optimizer choose a different path. Um, or it can't estimate every possible plan. Um, based on the number of like, joins you have, you know, it's going to be n factorial, where n is the number of joins. So sometimes it can't estimate every possible plan. 
So if you think it's wrong, um, and uh, I would tread carefully there, um, you can use straight join uh, in your select, and that'll say, you know, hey, optimizer, do all the joins in the order I tell you, not the order you think is best. You can also tell it to use an index, uh, ignore an index, or force an index. Um, and the difference between use and force is use will say, hey, out of these indexes, you can choose these. And force will say, you have to use this one. Even if you think a full table scan is better because of the amount of rows, use this index. Um, I've only had to use these a couple of times. Um, so I would, I would avoid these unless you know for sure that the optimizer is being silly. Um, I think that's time. Thank you.